same mate. Seabirds live for a long time. A former has been recorded living to 50. In theory, this pair could spend 40 seasons raising chicks. They have such a short summer window to get it right, so they need to get straight on with the job of raising young. It's amazing in these colonies how every part of the cliff is bagged by one species or another. The razorbills claim the boulder beaches. They lay a single egg loose amongst the stones. Their nearest neighbours, the shags, may be prehistoric looking, but at least they take the trouble to build a nest, even if it's just an untidy pile of seaweed. In good years, each pair can fledge up to three chicks. Moving up the cliff face, the guillemots chance the ledges. This precarious lifestyle may explain why they only attempt to raise one chick. Higher still, the elegant kittiwake is more of a perfectionist. These high-rise dwellers build a perfect cup nest, giving their youngsters a safer start. These graceful birds are so named because of their call. Listen. Kittiwake, kittiwake, a sound that embodies the seabird colony. The crowning glory of this seabird city is of course the puffins. They take the penthouses, the grassy cliff tops with the best views. And they act as if they own the place. There's nothing more enjoyable for visitors to seabird islands. It's to sit in the sun, a lovely June day like this amongst the puffins. It's one of the real wildlife spectacles of the British Isles. They're just beautiful little birds. They've got such brilliant red legs, brightly coloured bills, very comical expressions. And these birds here are the off-duty birds and their mates will be incubating eggs under the ground. Hidden away, the eggs are safe from predators. Fair Isle, like many of our best seabird islands, doesn't have any foxes or even rats which could sneak in and steal their eggs. This is one reason why puffins are such confident little birds. There are plenty of adults, it's an idyllic scene. So what's the problem? Well, once these parents have young to feed, they are tied to the nest and can't go far to find food. These birds don't choose our islands just for the great views and the safe nesting sites. They flock here because our coastal waters offer the best fishing. And the criteria are the same, whether you're a puffin or a skewer. If they are to thrive, the one thing all these seabirds must have is a good supply of fish close to their nests. Puffins rely heavily on one particular fish, the sand eel. These tiny fish live and grow on the sandbanks just offshore. They may be small, but they're full of fatty oils, perfect for building up hungry chicks. And typically they're plentiful, just as the puffins are ready to feed their young. This is a classic image of a puffin, its beak stuffed full of oily fish. But it's become a rare sight on Fair Isle. For the last few years these birds have struggled to find enough sand eels so their chicks have starved. Puffins don't give up easily. They can cope with a few bad years. But if they fail to breed year after year, 
then eventually our cliffs will fall silent. So it's crucial to find out, have these birds had a few unlucky years or is something fundamental affecting the sand eels and the seabirds which depend on them? To get to the bottom of this, I need to speak to the people who really know their seabirds, beginning with the man who's got my old job. For the last seven years, Derek Shore has been warden here on Fair Isle. He spends every summer out on the boat, just like I used to, checking the birds. It's wonderful to be back out here again, but I'm worried about what I might find. You can see the gaps where they, where they so, used to be. I mean, this colony used to be absolutely covered in them. There's a lot yeah. of gaps, and there yeah. are groups of birds incubating, but there's a lot that a lot don't birds seem that are to not, have yeah. any uh -huh. eggs. Uh -huh. there's, but there's a lot more than there was, say, in 2004, for really? instance, just two years ago. I came so, into the colony and counted ten eggs. Ten eggs? Yeah. Uh -huh. And in the best year in this colony? And there was about two and a half thousand. So, you know. <coughs> Oh, Times have changed. <laughs> really? That's terrible. Some of these guillemots are so hungry, they're not even fit enough to lay eggs. Ten eggs from over 2,000 pairs. That's nothing short of a catastrophe. As we just come out of the tunnel here, if you look above you, you see Kittiwick nests. There's probably about 500 nests on this cliff above us. Really? And have you looked at this this year at all? We've not. No, this is our first trip so through, this is actually. the first trip. Yeah, there they are. They're... But there's not that many. <laughs> no, there's far fewer than there used to be. If you look around, you see there's lots of white patches mm. on the cliff. You can see where oh, they right. used to be nests, and there are no. And these ones here are not. Those are not breeding. They're just sitting around. Yeah, these are. This is a worrying sign. Seen groups of birds just standing around, not doing anything. So it's a kittiwake you've really had problems with. Kittiwakes are probably having more problems than any other species um, because they're reliant on. They are reliant on sandy like everything else, but um, they're restricted to feeding on the top few inches of the water. So um, whereas the orcs and stuff can dive a bit deeper. The orcs, puffins, guillemots and razorbills should be more resilient because they can dive deeper for fish. Whereas these delicate kittiwakes have to fish at the surface and if the food's not there, they go hungry. How have their numbers changed? When I first came here in 1999, there was 11,000 pairs. Um, last year's count was um, 5,000. So they've halved in just a few years. And what about their production of young? Yeah, they've had several bad breeding seasons. Um, there was one year, 2004, when there was none. No young no, no, reared no at ring, all? No young reared at all. You know, I a small just number were reared last year. But. I'd heard the stories, but seeing it for myself is a shock. I can't believe how bad it's got for birds like kittiwakes. And the damage doesn't stop there. Other seabirds rely on the sand eel fishers doing the hard work for them, including one of my favourites, the Arctic skewer. It's known as a pirate because it chases smaller birds, knocks them out of the sky and nicks their fish. They're so agile, I can watch them forever until they decide to have a go at me. And they come back in the spring and they start yodeling and displaying and just a fantastic noise. And now they're on eggs in the heather and wherever you walk on Vera, in the heather you're likely to get attacked by these birds. They just are so spectacular. And uh, many a bird watcher has come running off the hills. But if you hold your hand up, you're okay. And very quickly they go back to their nests. When I was here in the 60s, there were 70 pairs, and then they increased to 180, and now there's just 70 again. They've been having very bad years. 
There's a real worry about them because if the population continued to decline, it just wouldn't be this fantastic bird living here on Vera. The great skewers have been hit too. They're bigger and tougher than the Arctic skewers, but not so skilled in the air. They use their sheer bulk to have a go at other birds. More of an opportunist, they can fish perfectly well, but they'll also scavenge or even bully other birds for their catch. The locals call them bonksies. The best place to see them is Fula, another of Shetland's spectacular seabird islands. It's not just the bonksies that brought me to Fula. It's also to meet world-renowned seabird expert, Professor Bob Furness. Yeah, whoops. This bird that's shouting is obviously defending a territory mm. and it's um, likely to have a nest just here. There is an old nest there. Yes, there's a chicken oh, yeah. over here. Yeah. Now, for your studies, you must have ringed a lot of bonksy chicks in your life. About 30,000. Really? <laughs> I see. <laughs> and in the best year? Um, about 2,000 in a good year. So that's 2,000 out of 2,000 pairs. pairs? Yes. And in a bad year? Um, none. None? None and at which all. Which was the worst year? 2004. Not mm -hmm. a single chick fledged. Good Lord. Do you think that one's going to survive? What is this year I like? don't think this year will be terribly good, but we'll have to see. Bob can make a prediction this early in the season because he's followed the fortunes of these birds for over 30 years. And this is the biggest great skewer colony in the world. But for the last few years, the bonksies on Fuller have been in trouble. Bob's got some clues as to what's been going wrong. This is where you do some really interesting research. Well, because the birds are sitting here a lot, when they've digested their food, they regurgitate pellets the mm. same way that owls and birds of prey do. Mm -hmm. So we can come to these points and collect pellets and then identify the kind of food that the birds have been taking. Down here there's oh, a right. couple there's of a pellets. Pellet. In fact, two pellets. This, this is a, a pellet consisting of fish bone. Now that one doesn't look like fish at all. No. That's feathers, entirely made of feathers. And these black feathers are, are yeah. almost certainly a puffin. It could possibly mm -hmm. be a guillemot or a razorbill, but it's most likely to be puffin. So these are now killing these seabirds. Now, yeah. Now, have you seen any change over the years between fish? Very, very dramatic. Yeah. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s, they fed mainly on sand eels, and very, very few birds were killed. But in the last few years, they've been killing more and more birds and uh, particularly killing kittiwakes and puffins, but killing a huge variety. Uh, but they've been having a big impact on the populations of kittiwakes in Shetland. Incredible. And in 2004, um, there was so little food that the adults were eating each other's chicks, and none of the chicks survived. That's disastrous. With the shortage of sand eels, these skewers are not just killing more seabirds, They've even started to cannibalise their own chicks. Over half the world's great skewers breed in the United Kingdom, so if the trend continues, the bonksy could soon end up on the endangered list. When I began this quest, people were quick to remind me that seabirds have faced crises before. They're long-lived birds, so they always seem to bounce back from trouble. In Victorian times, they declined dramatically. The birds and their eggs were collected for food. And their feathers were prized by the fashion world. They were even shot for pure sport. There was an outcry, and in the late 19th century, 
they became the first group of birds to be protected by law. In the last century, a new crisis hit seabirds. Oil spills. Ships carrying oil came to grief on our shores, spilling their sticky cargoes. Infamous names like the Torrey Canyon, the Brer which hit the Shetland Islands, and a few years later the Sea Empress are etched on our memories. Like hundreds of others, I've helped out at serious oiling incidents. But when they are this far gone, it really is hopeless. I used to think oil was the worst thing that could hit seabirds, but not anymore. Oil trashes one bit of coast at a time, so the birds at least get a chance to recover. This new crisis is far more worrying because it's affecting birds season after season and at colonies right around the North Sea. From the Shetland Islands, down the east coast as far as Yorkshire, seabirds are struggling to feed their chicks. So why aren't these birds finding sand eels? Sand eels won't end up on your plate, but they're still valuable to fishermen. Harvested by the billions, they're pulped and turned into food for pigs and farmed fish. In fact, sand eels are so oily that they were once used to fuel Danish power stations. It's big international business, so it's tempting to blame the big offshore fisheries for the lack of sand eels, especially where these fisheries are concentrated in the north and east. It makes me wonder what life is like for seabirds where sand eels aren't harvested. I've travelled 800 miles south from Shetland to the island of Skomer off the Welsh coast. I've never been here before and it's a beautiful island. I'm really interested to know how the seabirds are doing here because it's the biggest seabird colony in southern Britain. The warden, Ewan Brown, is keen to show me the star attraction. It's mid-June, so both parents should be busy out at sea collecting fish for their young. Their single chick is tucked safely away, but calling loudly just in case he's forgotten. What's this population? How is it doing? The population on Skoma of puffins seems to be fairly stable. We're, we're consistently mm. counting about 10,000 individuals every spring, and it seems to have been that way for about the last few decades. So this population looks as though it's getting a reasonable amount of food? Yeah, thankfully, um, we haven't had the problems that they've experienced further north uh, with, with food shortages over the past few years. And indeed, as we've been seeing today, them bringing in these uh, beakfuls of glistening sand eels to this year seems to be quite good as well. How far are some of these birds going to fish? Any idea where these birds are getting fish? Um, these birds can travel quite a few miles offshore. Um, typically puffins will be within 10 miles of the island, but certainly recent days we've been seeing these mass big feeding frenzies of seabirds, these rafts of puffins and guillemots and, and kittiwakes dip feeding, which suggests that there are a lot of sand eels very close into the island. It's great to see things like they should be, with birds racing back and forth to their young, because there's plenty of food nearby. Now in Shetland, kittiwake numbers are really down, but I can hear kittiwakes there, and they're on nests incubating. How is the kittiwake done here? Kittiwakes on Skoma, thankfully, haven't suffered as they have further north. We've got a fairly stable population, which averages about getting on for 2,500 pairs. 
Now, what about guillemots? Because, again, in the north, there's been a, a sharp decline in the last five years. What's the situation here? Guillemots have been on the increase for about the last 30 years on the island. In fact, the graph goes quite sharply up. However, last year we saw a real population explosion. We counted nearly 20,000 individuals, which was a 40% increase on the, on the previous year. And I wonder whether it, we are seeing birds from further north, from the, these colonies that failed in 2004, um, relocating yeah, to here. Relocating. Not only are the birds doing well, Skomer may actually be supporting refugees from the struggling colonies in the north. We know there's no sand eel fishery here, so at least on the surface we might suspect that the sand eel fishermen are fueling the seabird claps around our northern colonies. But there's another side to the story. Hanson Black works for the Shetland Fishermen Association. I put it to him that industrial sand eel fishing is responsible for the breeding failures around the North Sea colonies. I think it's too easy. To, I mean, we're, we're living in a kind of blame culture at the moment. That if something is, is having a, a poor time in nature, we have to blame somebody and it has to be a man-made problem. Uh, I think that, that in, on the back of there being no fishing, there was uh, no marked improvement in the sand eel fishing in the waters around Shetland. Uh, it, I think that it'll, it'll come and go, you know, nature always fluctuates around and the, the sand eels are, are, are going through a poor period. Fish do have natural ups and downs. Local Shetland fishermen, like the seabirds, have also struggled to find enough sand eels and agreed to limit their fishing. In fact, catches became so poor that in 2005 the entire industrial North Sea sand eel fishery was suspended for 11 months. To be honest, uh, having healthy fish stocks uh, is uh, important to a lot of people, but no, nobody more so than the fishermen themselves healthy fish stocks then we won't have an industry here so it's very important to have to, to have the whole thing in balance striking that right balance what fishermen can catch and what gets left for nature is something fishermen and scientists argue about every year it is still tempting to believe as I do that the industrial fisheries have an impact but then last season something happened that completely overshadowed that debate A new seabird SOS came from hundreds of miles away from the troubled North Sea. For the first time, the alarm sounded on the other side of Scotland, from Canna, on the western coast. This Hebridean island is home to another spectacular mix of seabirds. But here, too, they've run into trouble. Bob Swan has been ringing the seabirds of Canna for the last 30 years. I asked him what went wrong. Last year was, was absolutely disastrous. There was something went wrong. We don't know quite what it was. The most eerie thing was the, the silence. When we went down the north side, there was no noise. You know, normally you get the kitty weights calling away and the, the ox and that. And it was just quiet. And we went into these colonies and there was just no sign of the birds. But whatever went wrong, there was a lack of fish. Uh, the birds were starving. Uh, a lot of them had laid eggs, but they just gave up. Uh, the chicks that we did come across were very underweight, very undernourished. They were often starving. They were screaming out for food. Uh, we did ring quite a few, and interestingly, none of these were ever seen of again. We think that probably when they went to sea, they were in such weak condition that they actually died. So it was just a... A disaster, but as I say, it's never happened before here on the West Coast. Do Typical. you think there's any overfishing in this area affecting them? Not really. Uh, and there's no, I mean, there's no commercial fishing of sand eels. I believe there is a bit of a sprat fishery in the winter, but I don't think it's on a massive mm -hmm. scale, mm -hmm. and there's certainly been no problem in the past. So we don't think it's overfishing. So if it's not overfishing, what's going on? One clue comes from the birds themselves. On this western coast, they don't just rely on sand eels. They'll catch sprats and other small fish too. 
So if sand eels are scarce, they should be able to find other fish. The fact that all the seabirds went hungry suggests that whatever's going on, it's hitting several fish species. Are these starving seabirds warning us that whole marine food chains are beginning to collapse? Could you see any changes in the sea? Well, there was one noticeable change, and that was with basking sharks. Basking sharks turned up far earlier than we've ever had them before, and also in much greater numbers. Basking sharks are significant because, like sand eels, they feed on microscopic plankton in the water. And if these giants are passing by Canna early, it could suggest a change in the distribution of plankton. In fact, scientists believe the mix of plankton around our shores is changing. Cold water species are being replaced by warm water ones, and total abundance has fallen. Why? Because of warming seas due to climate change. And while basking sharks are free to seek out the plankton, young sand eels have to stay put on the sandbanks. This is where they grow and mature, so this is where they need their plankton. Could it be that, like our seabirds, these little fish are going hungry? Now is the perfect time to find out, because the birds are busy bringing fish to their young. On the Isle of May, Professor Sarah Wanless has been catching birds bringing back food to find out how the fish themselves are faring. Oh, those are quite small, aren't they? Oh, please go up. So you're catching these adults coming back with food. Yes. So in terms of in terms of, of the puffins, then I mean there will be thousands of burrows here, mm. like thousands of burrows. So as far as the birds are concerned, this isn't having an impact mm. on them. Mm. But what it does is, is show us in huge detail what the birds are bringing in. And the load you've got there is actually a pretty good load. So that's a sprat. So that's that's a that's potentially a very good food load and then a, and these are probably sand eels that, that probably are a, a year mm. old okay so those ones aren't too bad those two mm. they're, yes they're, they're not small, too, yes they? they're a bit small but that's yeah. actually not too bad so mm. if you're a puffin chick you'd be quite happy to get that what I've got here I mean there's a lot of mm. fish here but mm. they're very small they'll have hardly any sort of fat or mm. nutrient sort of value to them at all mm. so essentially well, that's just a bit of sort of salty water yeah so, so there's you're no not, shine on them no, no silver no, nothing no and you're not going yeah. you're not going to grow fat on those yeah mm. I think that's what's really impressive is mm. that not just watching the fish that are coming in but having being able to see the quality mm -hmm. and work at that from year to year. That is when it really brings it home yes. to you, just what sort of change we've, we've experienced. Because I remember the sand deals you with it. it yes. And they were more like this. They exactly. were longer, of course, and not yeah. so fat across there, but they were always big fish. Mm. Yeah. And you get those classic pictures, you know, with a, with a puffin, Hanging. and it really hangs down mm. like one of those big sort of mm. droopy moustaches. Mm. Whereas when the birds are flying around with these, you, ha you just see a little sort of fuzz, yeah. but you don't yeah. see a, 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 yeah. a big conspicuous fish. So here's real evidence that there are sand eels around, but they're too small and thin to provide puffin chicks with the fats they need to thrive. Gradually, more and more scientists are pointing a finger at climate change. So does that mean the sand eel fishery is off the hook? Now, if the sea temperatures here are higher, the birds survive less well and they produce less chicks. OK, so there's your climate effect. But if there is also a, a local fishery operating close by, the birds survive even worse and they also breed even worse so there you see to some extent the, the problem of trying to say well is it the fishery or is it the climate it's both 
so they're being hit by a double blow. If climate change is already having an impact, what does that mean long term for these birds? Scientists like Sarah have only just begun to ask these questions, let alone answer them. But we do know the North Sea has already warmed by one degree, which is an enormous change for a sensitive, finely balanced ecosystem. Latest climate change models predict that the sea temperature will continue to rise in the waters all around our coast. So it looks as though life will get far tougher for our seabirds. Yet I'd be painting a false picture if I implied that all our seabirds are in trouble. There's one that bucks the trend. This is the Bass Rock off the East Lothian coast. It's absolutely fantastic. There's 50,000 gannets nesting on this. It looks like a huge cake covered in icing. And there's just swirling birds like giant snowflakes. Well, this is absolutely incredible, and this is only a little bit of it. This is the kind of edge that you can come and walk to from the lighthouse. There's just thousands of birds breeding here. And all around is a swirl of gannets as they come in. It is stunning on a day like this. The increase in our gannets has been amazing. Over the last 40 years, their population has almost doubled to well over a quarter of a million breeding pairs. And in the last five years, whilst numbers of birds like kittiwakes have started to crash, gannets have continued to boom. So why are the gannets doing so well? Part of the answer is that gannets are one of the species that follow boats. When the fishing industry thrived, they followed trawlers, scooping up fish that was thrown back. The difference is, if there are no boats to follow, gannets can dive deep to catch herring and mackerel, much larger fish than the smaller seabirds. And while sand eel stocks decline, herring have been increasing in recent years. Most importantly, gannets can hunt far and wide. If there are no fish near the coast, they fly to Norway and back to find food for their chicks. All this would be fine if we were happy to have all our seabird cliffs filled with gannets. But for me, it's the sheer variety of seabirds which makes Britain's colonies so special. As if to underline the threat, I've just heard bad news from Skomer off the Welsh coast. In what's turning out to be the hottest July on record, the puffins are still doing okay. But for the fulmers, razorbills and guillemots, it's looking like the worst season since records began. It's far too early to be sure what's happening on Skomer, but if it is part of the climate change story, then that's incredible news. It means a whole new stretch of coastline could now be affected. I'm also getting reports of guillemots and kittiwakes faring badly at the other colonies we visited. And it's becoming clear that 2006 is proving yet another bad year. We know that climate change is a global problem, which people are just starting to wake up to. 
But can we act fast enough? Or are we already too late to help birds like kittiwakes? I put this question to a man who's long been campaigning to save our seabirds, the RSPB's head of marine policy, Dr. Ewan Dunn. Well, it may well be that in the years to come, these seabirds are feeding largely on all sorts of warm water species, anchovies, pilchards. We don't know, but seabirds are very long lived. Many of these kittiwakes are probably living to 25, 30 years. They have a long lifespan, they learn a lot in their lives, they're very resilient creatures if they get half a chance. And they will adapt very, very quickly to new circumstances. So um, there is there's hope there. It's fantastic to hear this, that given enough time these seabirds could adapt to climate change. But how do we give them that time? What about the kittiwakes, guillemots and puffins, struggling to feed their chicks this year and next? Well, the RSBB's had Bempton Reserve now since about 1969, and we very, very carefully control what happens on the cliffs. So the, the birds are not going to come to any harm on the cliffs. But in the UK, there is virtually no protection at sea for seabirds at the moment. We've protected all sorts of areas on land, but out at sea, this is, this is the empty quarter of nature conservation. We're just beginning to get to grips with it. Now, what we're looking to do is to extend the protection on the colony out to sea. And at the moment, the, um, the authorities in the UK um, are beginning to work out just how to do that. At the moment, they're looking at rather small extensions of maybe a mile or so offshore. From my point of view, I think we need a much bigger area there to protect the sand deal stocks for these birds, and, and really the birds deserve the best we can give them. As I head back to Fair Isle, I'm much more optimistic. There clearly is something we can do. We're a coastal nation, we all love the sea, yet we only have three tiny marine nature reserves. We have so many nature reserves on land. Why don't we have more at sea? A marine bill is being discussed at the moment. It will address the many conflicting demands on our seas, not just from the fishing industry, but from a whole raft of other activities wanting a slice of the waters around our shores. So it's even more crucial that the needs of our seabirds are taken into account. Forty years ago, when I was the warden on Fair Isle, the island and the birds were well protected. But even then, I was worried about the fish. I remember seeing hundreds of boats scooping up great shoals of herring. Today, my fears of overfishing have been made worse by fears of what climate change could do. This is why Fair Isle is so fantastic. It's nine o'clock at night, the sun is over the Ward Hill, the highest point, and I'm looking across to Sheep Rock and the fulmers are just gliding in front of me and they're nesting down here amongst the sea pinks. The kind of smell of the seabirds is coming up from the cliff below me. But really what I want to know is how have the seabirds done this summer? And happily, there's some good news. Arctic skewers are having a better season. They're finding fish for those lovely plump chicks. Not sand eels, but the young of other species like cod and herring. This is promising. It shows, like Ewan said, that these birds are adaptable. Hopefully, with a fair wind, they'll start to catch whatever fish thrive in warmer seas. The puffins have also found a new kind of fish to feed their young, but there's a cruel twist to their story. These puffins are bringing in this long bony thing known as pipefish. Not only do pipefish have no fat on them, they're a serious choking hazard for baby chicks. You've got to give these puffins credit. No sand eels, so they're working their socks off to find something else. 
Derek and his assistant are finding handfuls of discarded pipefish inside the puffin burrows. Nest 24 is empty. There's a whole lot of dead pipefish in it. Three, four, five, six or seven discarded pipefish. The chicks managed to spit out the pipefish, but did they survive? This little chap is doing his best to make a meal out of what looks like a piece of string. Choking on a pipefish. No, slowly digest it. This is one bird which definitely needs more time to try to get it right. If we can give these puffins a help in hand now, by protecting the remaining sand eel stops, the chances are they will ride the changes and stay with us. The kittiwakes really bring it home. They're perfect parents as long as they can find food for their chicks. Yet far too often they're failing. When I see starved chicks in the nest like this, I wonder how many more wake-up calls we need. Finally, now in late July, I'm hoping to catch the last of the guillemot chicks fledging. There we go. That little one is expected to leap straight off the ledge and into the North Sea. The parent bird, the father, sits on the water calling the chick, encouraging it to jump. They always look as though they really don't want to go. Sometimes they need more persuasion from their mother. And then they finally take that huge leap over the edge. And it really is a bold leap because these chicks are so much thinner than they should be. Their parents have obviously struggled to fatten them up. As they swim out into that vast cold wilderness, they face winter on their own. We could just wish them luck. Better still, we could do something to help. There's obviously things happening in the sea on a very big scale that we probably can do very little about. But there are things that we can influence. We should have a far better conservation policy marrying the sea environment with the terrestrial environment where these birds breed. We find that they have a struggle at the present time rearing their chicks. So we should give them the best possible chance. And it's 